Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. Alleluia. Welcome to First Lutheran Church of Manhattan Beach. We love that you have joined us this morning for our fifth Sunday of Easter celebration. We continue to celebrate that Jesus, our Savior, has been written, resurrected from the grave, and he promises us that same gift. Also, to each of you mothers who are joining us this morning, happy Mother's Day to you. We are so thrilled uh, that we, and we celebrate with you. Also, each of us celebrates our own mothers, the opportunity that, that these women took to give us life. So we praise the Lord for that gift today. Today, we're going to continue our sermon series focusing on the resurrection realities. Resurrection reality on identity and how that informs our identity, how it transforms our identity. As we worship the Lord this morning, I invite you to join me as we sing our opening hymn, Alleluia, Jesus is Risen, verses 1 through 3. sins. O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ Jesus, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. I invite you to join me as we take a moment to silently confess our sins before our God, our Father. Knowing that we have corporately confessed together, we now bring those individual sins to our Lord, knowing he is our forgiver.
Our gracious God hears the confessions of our hearts and the confessions of our mouth. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office, as a called ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I announce the grace of God unto each of you, and in this stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me as we sing the remaining two verses of Alleluia, Jesus is Risen. God in prayer, and let us pray together. O oh God, you made the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This time I invite you to join me as we hear God's re the reading from God's Word for this morning. Good morning. If you would like to follow along with today's readings, please do so in your Bible or on the screen. The Old Testament reading for today is from the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, beginning at the first verse. Now this is the commandment the statutes and the just decrees that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over, to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The epistle reading for this morning is from 1 Peter, the second chapter, beginning at the second verse. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, 
and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. At this time we'll hear the Holy Gospel reading for this the fifth Sunday of Easter. This morning's Gospel reading is from John the 14th chapter. It actually occurs in the week leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. But it's the promise of Jesus that he even now prepares a place for you and for me that we might be with him forever and eternity. We hear the reading of the Holy Gospel. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to join me as we confess with Christians around the world and throughout the ages our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. At this time, I invite all the children who are watching with us this morning to come close to the screens as Mr. Mark shares with us this morning's children's message. Hello, everyone. Come on down. Children, big and small and young and old, come on down, and, and we can uh, start with our children's message. I always believe that these children's messages, I think, are more for the congregation than the children sometimes. 
But yeah, it's wonderful to have all of you here with us. It's wonderful to be able to be here and, and uh, play music for these services. It's really awesome. Um, what a crazy time that we're in right now. Um, but this is really a time where we can put all that aside and just praise God. So uh, let's begin. We we're talking today a little bit about uh, your identity. So I first I started with saying, children, young and old, come on down. So I actually kind of gave you guys an identity, an identity there, which would be children. Now, are we all children? Now, that's kind of an interesting question. Some of us might be really young and some of us might be really old, but we're all children of God. So that's definitely one identity. I'm trying to think of other identities we can have. So when you guys wake up and you go on your Zoom, so you're uh, watching your teacher teach you, what is your identity there? You become a student. When all that's done and you close your computer, um, all of a sudden you become a child of your mom and dad or a brother or sister to all of your other siblings, right? Or maybe you have an adopted cat, so maybe you're a cat mom or a cat dad. I, I don't know. You have a lot of different identities that you can have uh, in this life. It's kind of like wearing different hats. Sometimes you're a student and sometimes uh, you're a, a child. Sometimes you're, you listen to your mom and dad. Sometimes you go to school. Sometimes you're at the grocery store. We all have a lot of different identities. Um, one thing that's super important to think about today is, uh, is being a child, being a, a son or daughter to your mother. That's something that's really awesome. And actually a lot of us get our name from our mom and dad, which is so incredibly important. Now I come from three boys. So the oldest is Christian, the middle son is Michael, and of course, I am Mr. Mark. I didn't come with the Mr. to begin with. It was just Mark for a while, but I became Mr. Mark. So why do you think my parents chose those names? Christian, Michael, and Mark. Well, I think actually all of those names came from the Bible. Christian is someone who follows Christ. We call him Chris most of the time. But when he's in trouble, he's Christian. And then Michael, he is in the Bible as well. He was an archangel, which is pretty awesome. And then Mark was one of the books in the Bible that we have as well. So uh, my parents thought it was so important to give us a name or an identity in Christ. Now, even if your name is Bob or Apple or whatever, you are still God's child. Now, of course, my parents decided to choose Christian names, but it doesn't matter if you have a Christian name or a not Christian name or whatever kind of name. We are all children of God. That is our true identity, is children of God. And it's so wonderful that God has given us so many different people in our lives to, to help us through this life. And today, of course, we especially thank God for our mothers who raised us, who fed us, who continue to feed us, help us, and guide us through our lives. They're the best example that we have of God's love. So today, remember your identity, not only as a brother or sister or a student or a child uh, or son or daughter, aunt and uncle, whatever it is. Also remember that you're a child of God and God calls you calls you by name. He knows every hair on your head. You are, your identity comes from God, comes from Christ, because we are Christian. So always remember to love your mom and dad, especially today. Love your mom because it's Mother's Day. Celebrate the wonderful identity you have as her son or daughter. But always remember that you are a son or daughter, a child of God. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for this opportunity for us to gather, even if it's through the internet. We can still gather together and sing your praises and, uh, and be a community, be a church. We ask today that you be with all of our mothers. Give us a wonderful day to celebrate them. 
help all of our mothers to maybe just relax and, and take this day to, to, to celebrate themselves, to, to be, to, to, because it's Mother's Day, to celebrate those mothers and women in our lives, since the women are so important in the church. Help us to recognize them, and most importantly, help us to realize that we are all children of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Always important to remember our identity as children of God. As uh, we uh, continue our service this morning, we'll continue with singing a song about being a child. And uh, we'll sing, it's actually an epiphany hymn, but it's, I want to walk as a child of the light, a reminder of whose we are, children of God. Please join me in singing our hymn of the day, I want to walk as a child of the light. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ Jesus, we are sons and daughters of the King. We are sons and daughters of the resurrected one, Jesus. Today, we continue to celebrate this promise. May God's grace, his mercy, and his peace be with each and every one of you. May you know the joy that comes in being called a child of God. Today, as Mr. Mark shared, as I shared at the beginning, we're going to talk about identity and how the resurrection of Jesus transforms everything. It even transforms our identity, who we are and whose we are. 
Please join me now as we meditate, as we prepare to meditate on God's word today with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Oh Lord Jesus, we thank you for your resurrection. And in this fifth Sunday of Easter, we continue to celebrate this good news, for we know that it is not just a one-day celebration or a one-time-a-year celebration, but it is something that is meant to change our very lives, our very being, who we are. Lord, help us each day to be your children, not only when we come together and worship, but when you deploy us into the world. Help us to be your children in our homes, in our communities, to the very ends of the earth. Help us to be your children to a world that has been darkened by sin, that they may see your marvelous light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm sure, like me, many of you have been paying attention to the news in the last, let's say, six, seven weeks. Maybe you've had it on and you have finally said, I'm going to only watch it once a day. Maybe you've uh, put, put it on and said, man, I'm following it for hour after hour. I know I've talked to some of you and you said it's in the background always. And so you, you catch every market fluctuation, whether it bumps up, whether it drops down. Well, today I wanted to remind you of a piece of news that we had this week. I mean, it had nothing to do with the market, had nothing to do with the pandemic. Elon Musk had another child. Aren't you guys so excited? Aren't you say uh, I can see it in your faces. I, you're thrilled. Elon Musk, eccentric billionaire, had another child. He, uh, and, uh, and if you know anything about uh, Elon Musk, you know that he is very unique. He's the type of guy who say, thinks it's a good idea to send flamethrowers to, to the average American household. Or he's come up with the concept of the boring company, right? That to dig under LA and make, a, you know, from Hawthorne to the airport and uh, alleviate traffic. And, uh, uh, you know, so when you think about Elon Musk, you can imagine that the, his child's name is about as eccentric as he is. No mean to pick on him, but I'll be honest with you, I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. It starts with an X, then it's got this AE character, which sometimes that means LG, or sometimes that means antenna. So you really, so it's, it's X, maybe A, A, 12. Yeah, that, that's the name. I know, you're like, uh oh. Huh? Yeah, if, if you're wondering how his uh, classmates and his elementary school teachers are going to pronounce it, I don't know either. Probably every classroom will be different. Uh, but the, the Internet's all astir with this. I don't know if you've been paying attention, but everybody's wondering, what does this name mean? Now, Elon's come out with a little few comments. The baby's mom has had a few comments about this on Twitter. You know, that's the, the means uh, that we get all the most important news today. And, and, but, but really, nobody knows, and, and we probably will never know. But that name that they gave to their child is part of their, his identity, isn't it? It's part of who he is. And I wonder, as you think about interesting names, what about your name? Why did your parents give you your name? Why did they name you as they did? Some of you, as Mr. Mark talked about, you, you received biblical names, so my first name is a biblical name. Some of you, you receive family names, so my middle name is a family name. Uh, some of you were named after famous people. We have a child in the preschool who's named Blaze, named after uh, a famous uh, scientist and uh, theologian. Uh, we have another, uh, you know, you have others who are named after actors and actresses and famous people. Even a ph phenomenon, right? Starburst or Rainbow. And their parents named you after those things. So... Why did your parents name you as they did? What are the origins of your name? How do people identify you? You know, a name is, is really how we identify one another, isn't it? If I call you up on the phone or if I send you an email, I'll, I'll say, hello, is this? Or dear, you know, so-and-so, won't I? And it's, if you look at your driver's license, your name is printed out, all three of them, or maybe more if you have more, if you have a dash in there, things like that. Or if you think about a, a diploma on the wall, it has your name on it. It identifies you as one who's completed a degree. Or you sign a contract and, and you put your name in, in cursive. And, and even still, you know, kids are learning cursive today, so they're still able to sign their name. And, and it identifies you as one who is responsible. It's part of your identity, isn't it? Whether you're called by all three names when you're in trouble or whether you have a nickname, it's a part of your identity. And I want you to think about that for just a moment, it is what is the origin of your name? Why was it important for your parents to name you as they did? 
especially as we celebrate Mother's Day. You know, your moms and your dads deciding on what name they wanted to give you. Well, as important as names are, are they really, do they really capture our entire identity? Does your name tell people who you are? Sure, in one sense, if you know that my name is Jonathan, you know that I am Jonathan. But, but what does that tell you about me? Does that clue you in that I'm a pastor, that I'm a husband, that I'm a father? Not really. And so our identities are, are more than our names, aren't they? Our identities are, are more than just what we tell people on our social security card, on our driver's license. Our identities are wrapped up in in our lives. On Mother's Day, we think about oh, many moms who derive their identity, at least in part, from being a mom. Or, or those who are not moms who derive their identity of not being a mother. Or those who are fathers who derive their identity as being fathers or, or, or not being fathers. Those who are married and maybe derive their identity from being married to their spouse. Or those who are single derive their identity from being unattached. Those who are working versus those who are retired. Think about your identity. Not just your name, but, but what is your identity? How do people know you? Who are you? It's an important question. Because God has made us each unique and wonderful. And no two of us have the exact same identity. No two of us are exactly carbon copies, if you remember that concept of one another. Each of us is unique because God made us uniquely and wonderfully. He shaped us and formed us in the womb to be the people we are, to have an identity that is only ours. So what is yours? Well, today, Peter, he wants to make sure that you don't forget that over all those other identities, those identities that will change throughout the years, no doubt about it, that there's one identity that never changes. One identity that is foundational to all those other identities. One identity that we do share with one another. I want you to turn back with me to our epistle for this morning. And that's in 1 Peter chapter 2. So not 2 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to go to just the very, almost the very beginning of our reading. Now first of all, Peter identifies us as, as, us, as these uh, infants in need of that spiritual milk. But, but then quickly he changes his analogy. He changes the metaphor he's working with. And he wants us to connect with a different one. The mo metaphor of a stone. In particular, one stone. So let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. But if you have a different translation, King James, NIV, NLT, feel free to use that. Whatever you're most comfortable with. I just uh, And if you, even, if you want to use ESV, feel free. But I'm going to turn to verse 4 right now. It starts out as, uh, as you come to him, and, and, and that him is Jesus, as you come to him. A living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You might want to save the page. We're going to come back to this in just a moment. But you hear what, what Peter says there. Our foundation, who we are, is in Jesus we are built upon Jesus. He is the rock. He is the foundation of who we are. Because he has risen from the grave, we are resurrection people. We don't live each day as just those who are going through the motions one day after the next, after the next, after the next, after the next. We are those who are living each day as sons and daughters of the king. You are a child of God. And that makes the difference. Because we live with the hope of the resurrection. We live with the promise of eternal life. But there's something more that's going on with what Peter said there. Did you notice he, he didn't borrow Paul's analogy, at least at this point. Paul, Paul likes to use the analogy of the body when he talks about the people of God. But, but Peter here, he uses the analogy of a house. Foundational is Jesus, but, but, but that's just where we begin. Notice that's not where he ends. He talks about that we are each living stones built upon one another. We are each part of the spiritual household of God. 
No one of us is an individual, but we are the family of God. We are the people of God. We are the spiritual household. And as such, we depend on one another. As such, we live together as the house built one brick at a time, one stone on top of the other. But I find that far too often there's this concept in the world today. Maybe it's just in American Christianity. I don't know if it extends beyond the borders, but there's this concept of the Jesus and me idea. This idea that, that, that it's not about the spiritual household. It's about my relationship with Jesus. And nothing else matters. It's about an egocentric, sinful me. As long as I'm okay with Jesus, then the world's right. And that's not what's going on at all here in 1 Peter, is it? You look at 1 Peter here, and, and, and it talks about that we are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, not a holy priest. We are being built up as a priesthood, a body of believers. But when we limit ourselves to the me and Jesus attitude, oh sure, it's important to know that Jesus loves you, and you should not forget that. That Jesus cares about you, don't forget, ever forget that. That Jesus knows the count of hairs on your head, the number of cells in your body. Yes, he cares so deeply for you, but it is not just about you. Let me say that again, because I know that even though I'm talking to the church, we forget that. It is not just about you. It's not about Jesus and me, and about having a warm, fuzzy friend who makes me feel important, who makes me feel valuable. The Christian walk, our identity as believers, is about our relationship with God, but it's also about our relationship with one another. Because when we have this, it's all about Jesus and me, and know that everybody else falls out of the picture, don't they? We don't have to hold up a brother or sister in Christ as a valuable member because, well, it's about me. We don't have to think about the importance of a contribution of somebody because, well, my contributions are most important. And all of a sudden, it's this egocentric relationship that's all about me instead of about he. Instead of about Jesus. And then our identity falls away. Because that's not the identity of a child of God. That's a selfish, worldly identity found in American Christianity. This concept that in the church today, as long as I get what I want, then things are good. That's not God's word. From the beginning, God created us to be in relationship with one another, to love one another, to care for one another, to hurt when one part of the body is hurting. Now I'm borrowing from, from Paul here. To, to celebrate when one part of the body is celebrating. If you think of a house, if you think about it being built up, you can't just install a sink if you don't have the plumbing infrastructure and have drainage, can you? You might have a very beautiful sink. It might even have a crystal handles on the faucets. But what good does it do you if there's no plumbing coming to it? You might have a, a, a beautiful set of steps, but what if you don't have the reinforcement underneath the steps? You're going to fall flat. And that's what happens when we put our identity in just Jesus and me. So you know, Peter says that, that our identity is so much more than that. Peter, Peter he, he identifies us as a body of Christ, as a people, as a household of believers. And I love this text just a little bit further along. And I want, to turn, I want you to turn back. And, and if you're at home, please read with me aloud. I know I haven't asked you to do that. Usually we do that when we're here together in church. But I want you to read this passage aloud. And I want you to think about what it means. Let's turn to verse 9. So 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to go to verse 9. I want you to read this with me, all right? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I love that text. That is one of those texts that, if you, know, if you get a chance, I want that one read at my funeral, by the way. But, I, but let's not talk about that just yet. I want you to look at this text here. 
You, you are a chosen race. A chosen race that is not made up of just one type of people here in the South Bay community, but a, a, a race that is made up of every tribe, every nation, every tongue under heaven. A race that is not, color, that is, that, that is not divided by color or, or by tongue, but, but is all of God's people worshiping him together. A royal priesthood. What is a royal priesthood? No longer do we have to go before God with an intercessor. No one between us. We can go right to our Father with our every prayer and petition. The sacrifices are gone because Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. The people of God are not in one place at one time. But we transcend time and space. We are the people of God stretched from one end of the globe and one end of time till the end of time. You are part of that. You are part of that household of faith. You are a possession. God's own possession. Stop and think about that for just a moment. It's not just about who you are. Your identity has been given to you by the Father in heaven. Whose are you? You are a son of the king. You are a daughter of the king. You are a child of the Most High God. Because he has made you his possession. He has made you his own. Not by silver or gold, but by the precious sufferings and death of his son Jesus. Because we did live in that darkness. We lived in that darkness that separated us from God. We lived in that darkness that made us think that it was all about us. But now we have seen the marvelous light. And I love this word marvelous here. You don't catch it in the English, but in the Greek, it's this word thamazo. Thaumazo. And, it, and it's this idea that when you see this light, it, it, it's like you're a dead person. That's how powerful it is. It stuns you in your tracks. You are just deer in the headlights. And that is the amazing light of Christ that transforms who we are. At, once you were in, at one time you were in darkness. Now you have seen that light, that Thaumazo light, that wonderful light, that life-changing light. You have seen the good news that God did not just make it about you, but he made it about all humanity when he sent his son into the world, when he sent Jesus to lay down his life on the cross to be our salvation. Now, when Jesus came, as the text says, he was a stumbling block to some, wasn't he? Because they didn't want to believe that they needed him. That's that egocentric attitude again. They wanted to believe that they could do it by their works, that they could do it by what they could accomplish, by what they built. God sent the wrecking ball and said, no, you don't, not by you, not by power, not by might, but only by my son, by his sufferings and death. But that is the marvelous light, that it wasn't us. It was Jesus. Jesus who conquered death. Jesus who conquered the grave. Jesus who has conquered sin, death, and the devil. Jesus, our Savior, who has risen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. No matter what your name is, you are a child of God. Let us pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, we, we thank you that you have invited us to be part of your holy family. That in the midst of the darkness of this world, you have shown us your marvelous light. You have redeemed us, and you have made us part of your household of faith. Oh, Lord, may you build upon each and every one of us that we may support one another, that we may care for one another, that we may love one another as you have first loved us. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for those times when we make it all about ourselves. Forgive us for those times when we make it, a, make it this egocentric idea. Instead, may we always be Christocentric, focused on you, focused on your Son's salvation. This we pray in our risen Savior's name, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time, our service continues as we lift up our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. We give thanks to the Lord as we bring our offerings to his, to his tabernacle, as we bring these gifts, through all these gifts that we lift up, knowing that they come from him.
this time in our service, we continue with the prayers of the church. Uh, as you go to the Lord throughout this week in prayer, I ask that you continue to pray for our nation, pray for all those who continue to uh, battle uh, the pandemic, and uh, also give thanks as we see the hand of the Lord working. Uh, so make sure to thank the Lord for all he's doing as well. Also, uh, please keep in your prayers the aunt of uh, Carol Berman, who is uh, battling cancer. Also, uh, uh, friends of the Bakers, uh, the Hollow family, as they are mourning the death of their son Gideon. Uh, he was just nine years old. Please pray for their comfort. Also, uh, for other friends of the Baker family, uh, the Durazos, as they mourn the death of uh, Jordan's uh, father, Manuel. Please include them in your prayers uh, that the Lord might comfort them in the midst of their time of loss. Let us bow our heads and our hearts to our gracious God in prayer, knowing that he is faithful, he hears the prayers of our mouths and our hearts. Let us pray. Merciful Lord, we know that you have welcomed us into your holy family. You have made us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of your own possession. At one time we were in darkness, but now you have called us into your marvelous light. Lead us to live each of our days to the glory and honor of your holy name, as your daughters, as your sons. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for Christian ministries throughout the world seeking to bring hope to those living in despair and assurance that even in the midst of this pandemic, you are in control. Bless and keep each of these ministries, especially we pray for the ministries of Circle of Love Preschool and First Lutheran Church, that we would be wise stewards of all you've given us and that we would generously share your love and compassion with all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace and mercy, you have compassion upon the sick and those in need. You have promised not to ignore them in their afflictions. Turn back the pandemic across the globe and give us relief. Bless the sick with healing, those who suffer with strength, and the dying with peace. Dear Lord, hear us. On behalf of those who have requested our prayers, we name before you on our hearts and minds at this time. According to your goodness and compassion, grant to them healing and full restoration. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, for our life, for our breath, for all that we have, we give thanks to you. This week we especially give thanks with Lynn, with Beverly, with Boyd, with Garrett, with Carol, with Julie and with Harper, with Victoria and Denise, with Melanie and Sydney, with Robert and Kenzie, and all those who are celebrating birthdays this week. Bless and keep them, dear Lord, that in their birthday celebrations, they would revel in the joy and hope of your resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Dear Lord, all life is precious to you. We pray that you would hear our prayers on behalf of those who mourn the death of a loved one, especially the Hollow family mourning Gideon and the Durazo family mourning the death of Manuel. In the midst of their sorrow, comfort them, dear Lord, by the sending of your Holy Spirit. Grant to them your peace, which is beyond all understanding. Lord, in your mercy, hear Amen. our prayer. God of mercy, we pray for all those who serve in the armed forces. Surround and protect them from all enemies whether they be physical or spiritual. Give to them courage to carry out their duties with honor and valor. We too pray that you would surround with your protective arms all those who work on the front lines of this pandemic. Protect them from the virus. Grant them strength to help all those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Eternal Father, you are strong to save. We lift up prayers on behalf of our governing officials. May you grant to them your wisdom and guidance. Direct them that they would make decisions and pass laws and orders that are for the good of all people. Lead us, dear Lord, to honor our elected officials in all we say and do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you, God, for your goodness in hearing the prayers of your people and granting us confidence to approach your throne of mercy. Hear us now in the name and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom, with whom, in whom, in the unity of the Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, both now and forevermore. Amen. 
I invite you to join me as we continue our prayers today with a special prayer for our mothers. And this prayer is a reminder that uh, the Lord gives us each uh, mothers in different ways. So please join me in this response of prayer this morning and thanksgiving for all those who are mothers in various ways. Lord, on this day, set aside to honor and remember mothers. We give you thanks for our mothers. We are grateful that you chose to give us life through them and that they received the gift of life from your hands and gave it to us. Thank you for the sacrifices they made in carrying us and giving birth. We thank you for the women who raised us, who were our mothers in childhood, whether birth mom, adopted mom, older sister, aunt, grandmother, stepmother, or someone else. We thank you for those women who held us and fed us, who cared for us and kissed away our pain. We pray that our lives may reflect the love they showed us. They would be pleased to be called our moms. We pray for pregnant women whose children are growing in their wombs. Grant, Grant them patience and good counsel in the coming months. We pray for moms of young children. Grant them perseverance as they seek to raise their children in Christian homes. We pray for moms whose children are grown. Grant them joy and satisfaction having been faithful to God's will. We pray for moms who face the demands of single parenthood. Grant them strength and wisdom. We pray for moms who are separated from their children. Grant them faith and hope. We pray for moms who have lost children. Grant them comfort in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pray for moms who chose adoption for their children. Grant them peace and confidence as they trust in your providence. We pray for adoptive mothers. Grant them joy and gratitude for the gift you have provided. We pray for women who desperately want or wanted to be moms. Grant them grace to accept your timing and will. We pray for all women who have assumed the role of mother in a child's life. Grant them joy and appreciation of others. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of their mother on this Mother's Day. Grant them comfort and hope in Christ's resurrection. Lord, we thank you for the gift of motherhood. We thank you for the many examples of faithful mothers in Scripture, like Sarah, Hannah, Elizabeth, and Lois. We are mindful this day of all these women, and especially Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was given the courage and faith to respond yes to your calling. May all the women gathered here today emulate these examples of faith, and may they model for all the rest of us what it means to be your disciples. Bless them on this special day in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Taught by our Lord, remembering his promises, we are bold to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ is risen! He is, he is risen indeed. Alleluia! The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen. Please join me as we sing our closing hymn for today. At the Lamb's High Feast we sing verse 1 and verses 6 through 8.
so much for joining us this week at First Lutheran Church of Manhattan Beach as we went live this week, uh, the Lord willing, as we see the changes going on, and we know that we're in California in phase two now, and I believe churches are in phase three, uh, so keep praying. The Lord is moving. He is working, and uh, soon we'll hopefully be able to come together in person again. It's not that we aren't coming together in heart and mind. And we are a deployed church right now, but I know that each of you, like me, is looking forward to when we can sit together again in this place. And that may look different when we come back. I need to warn you of that now. I just want to put that before you. It may look a little different, but it's still a chance to be in God's house together. If you are able to join us, uh, we certainly invite you to, uh, to not only join us on 930 on Sundays, but on 520, uh, 525 on Wednesday nights, we also have a second worship service that we'd like to invite you to. Now, this is a little bit more of a relaxed worship service. It's a, a service that's meant more for just a time of prayer and meditation. Uh, we do have some singing with it as well, but mostly we're, we're kind of wa working our way through the book of Numbers, and we'd love for you to join us, as many of you have already. Uh, that's a few updates for this week. Actually, I hope to have a few more for you next week. I'm, I, I know it's on the cusp. I'm getting excited, folks, and hopefully you can see it. I think we're going to be able to worship together, even if it's a little different soon. So keep praying. Don't forget, every night uh, at 6 o'clock, keep lifting up those prayers, and our God is faithful. All right, that's all I got. So, uh, Art, if you would like to share this morning a few announcements, uh, please uh, invite you to come forward at this time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today's announcements. In about 10 minutes, everyone is invited to join us for a time of Bible study through Facebook Live. If you would like to follow along with the lesson, the sheets for all the lessons are available on Google Drive. Please continue to pray for our congregation, our communities, and our nation at 6 p.m. nightly. As always, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank mm -hmm. you.